Okay. Sure. And again, it'll appear on my end. And once it does appear on my end, I will uh, let you all know. Tiny little bit of a delay with a uh, Zoom and even with a uh, StreamYard. All right, but we are live now. So great that uh, wasn't too long of a delay. And I am here with my dear friend, Gary, as everybody knows, Gary, the master himself. And we have, um, we have an esteemed guest with us today. David uh, Saras, I believe, and if I am butchering his name, don't worry, he's going to tell you all that I'm butchering his name. But before we, uh, we get to introducing him, I'm pleased to be here with you, Gary. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And um, David, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as we, uh, as we dig into what we're going to be talking about today? And if you can tell the audience, what are we going to be talking about today? Sure. Uh, thank you, William, for the invitation. And Gary, of course, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Yes, I live in the Czech Republic. Actually, I'm Hungarian. My, my ancestors are Hungarian, but uh, yeah, it's complicated, but we are living in Slovakia. But then I moved to Czech Republic for my studies in medicine. And currently I'm working in Brno, uh, which is in the uh, South Marie, Moravian region of Czech Republic. And you know, when you're in Czech Republic, uh, sooner or later, you're gonna face a topic with uh, Jan Hus or John Hus, uh, as it is said in English. And it's an interesting topic because uh, I think it's not very uh, popular in other countries, maybe a bit in pieces are known about him, but uh, actually there are all, he's very popular in Czech Republic. We, there's also a you know free day when he's got his feast on sixth July, and um, he's also very interesting regarding uh, the Deuter the Deuter canonical books. So I am very happy to be here and uh, share the, all this information with you. Yes, indeed, and uh, yeah, I mean Jan Hus is. Uh... Uh, now, correct me, William, is the Morning Star the Reformation? I always get him confused with uh, Whitecliffe. No, you're, you're definitely correct there. Yeah. He, he is one of the ones that was dubbed the Morning Star of the Reformation. And really, um, look, before I became Catholic, he was a an important figure that we look to as being kind of a pillar of the faith. Now that I'm Catholic, of course... I know a lot of people maybe have never heard of him. Uh, can, can maybe, you know what, I'll maybe toss it to you a little bit, Gary. Why would, why is it important to even talk about Ian Huss? Uh, does, is he an important figure for certain individuals? Do you think it's important to really look at his usage of the Deuter Canonicals? Yeah, well, if anything, I, I think it gives us a snapshot at a, uh... You know, what was the status of the Bible, especially those who influenced the Protestant Reformation that happens a little later. Um, but um, really, the, the man to talk to is David. David, why is Jan Hus important? Yes, uh, already, as you men mentioned, he, he is somehow a, like a forerunner of the Reformation. Yeah even though he was very Catholic, you know, and in the beginning, he, he was very much Catholic. He was, he just really wanted to correct, correct the priesthood. And we have to admit there were problems in the church and the Renaissance and uh, in the medieval period. However, <clears throat> uh, all this uh, ideology and theology of his, it wasn't really his invention. He just adopted Wycliffe's uh, uh, theology and, and the philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he still didn't adopt everything. Uh, especially, he was uh, a big fan of the Marian cult and uh, praying to the saints and, and all this stuff. Uh, and by the way, he really liked scripture, but not the you know Protestant sola scriptura. <laughs> But uh, the Catholic Bible, really, indeed. Okay. So he, um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about his background. He was an academic. Um, you said he was a follower of, of Whitcliffe? Yes. Uh, actually, his career uh, began uh, on the univers uh, Charles University in Prague, uh, which was established by 
uh, King Charles IV. And by that time, uh, the checks were on the, the obedience of the real Pope. Everything was fine, except that uh, some of the clergy really weren't totally moral. And uh, he started his career on the Faculty of Arts. Uh, he, he earned the degree of a master, or magister. Uh, and only later he, he was studying uh, theology and uh, he finished his studies uh, with a degree of a bachelor. So, so he uh, didn't earn the master degree. He was only a bachelor. And uh, just 15 years before his trial, he, he was ordained uh, as a priest in, uh, in 1400. And after this, he started you know, preaching and uh, serving as a priest. But he was rather a preacher in the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Uh, that is when he got really popular in that time. But, you know, there are uh, some misconceptions about uh, Jan Hus, I'm afraid, uh, because, you know, there are some things uh, ripped out of the context and some disinformations. And I think we should enlighten the uh, audience with all these facts regarding him. But if you still have any other question before I start uh, regarding Jan Hus, you can ask me. Um, William, I don't know about you. Uh, that's no, no, I tell you what, really, the one thing that I really just um, I'm thrilled about is to have you really dive in as I'm reading what we've got on the screen in the, in the notes here. It's really, really amazing stuff. So definitely dive in. Well, yeah, before we do that, though, I, I do want to hear about these misconceptions with Jan Hus, though. There you go. You're right. Yeah, yeah. because I, I know it's a very complex situation that often people kind of have a, a generalized, idealized understanding that Hus discovered the true gospel and the Catholics burned him. And, uh, you know, and that's all there is to the story when there's actually a lot more, isn't there, David? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and stick, in fact, uh, I'm really, I really feel, uh, feel sorry about Jan Hans because he's something like, uh, you know, a weapon we can use against the church. Uh, and independently, who is using it? Because he was yeah. used by Marxists, he was used by, he's used by Protestants, he's used by even communists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who were like totally anti, you know, whatever religion, still they, they, uh, it didn't hesitate to use it against the Catholic Church, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So one of the mis misconceptions is that, you know, he was condemned for his fight against simony and uh, only because of the, his uh, criticizing the immoral status and behavior of only part of the clergy, because, you know, the clergy was huge, uh, just... Uh, in the cathedral of St. Vitus in Prague, there were like 600 priests, you know, and only a part of them may be like immoral or, or such. But all this is false because, because uh, uh, first of all, even before him, there were other, you know, uh, persons uh, who, who tried to correct the clergy. For example, uh, Konrad of uh, Waldhauser or Jan Milic from Kromierich, just to mention uh, some names. And uh, <laughs> the other thing is that uh, the Archbishop himself, the Archbishop of uh, Prague, who was named Zbigniew Zaitz, uh, supported him in this effort to correct uh, you know, the immoral uh, people. So uh, this is all false that he was you know, condemned for criticizing the the church and the, the clergy. That's not really it. Uh, it didn't happen on, really until he adopted a lot of things uh, from Wycliffe and started to say that uh, the whole church is you know, morally corrupt and uh, saying that the Pope was an antichrist and such things. So, uh, and also, as I said, he wasn't in conflict with the archbishop since the beginning. They had a very good relationship. The archbishop was supporting him. 
he also offered him to uh, say some sermons and homilies on the local synods. Uh, so uh, it, the, the relationship uh, didn't become extremely tense uh, only until like 408 when Hus uh, openly stood at the head of the Wycliffe camp. Also, a lot of people say like he was very pious and humble and uh, a big fighter for the moral life. Uh, but when we look at his relationship with the king, uh, with Wenceslau IV, uh, who was the son of Charles IV, then we get a quite different picture because this king, Wenceslau IV, was very cruel. He was also, it is said he was an alcoholic and an adulterer, which is you know, kind of strange when you're preaching about morality and on the other hand, you, you are in favor of the king. So it's like, it's, it's weird, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Haas attacked sharply the immoral life of clergy but we know, uh, remain silent to the enormous scandals and the immoralities of King Wenceslaus uh, is right, uh, rightly called hypocrisy. And another thing is with the help of this King Wenceslaus, uh, who's gained almost unlimited power in Prague. Uh, and coming from his position at the uh, university, because he was the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, also the rector of the university. And the university wasn't only about teaching, it was really, you know, supporting uh, ideology and uh, also uh, like politics. So uh, this is another interesting thing. And, uh, you know, Wenceslaus was for uh, several years the emperor of the uh, Holy Roman Empire. But later he lost this title also because his behavior and because he uh, could not deal with the, with the uh, heresies. Uh, and therefore he sized, sided with the uh, antipope Alexander V who was elected in Pisa, which was uh, an attempt to solve the, uh, the schism, the Western schism, however it, it, it wasn't really successful. On the other hand, uh, the Archbishop uh, of Prague was still uh, under the obedience of uh, Gregory the Twelfth, the real Pope. You know? mm. And we can see again all these politics here because the king only wanted to side with uh, Alexander V in order to gain back the title, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who took advantage of this and sided with the king. And at the same time, with, uh, with the antipope, of course, in order to deal with the archbishop and force him to side with the antipope. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's really a mess, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, yeah. So you got philosophy, you have politics, you have uh, basically trying to control the, the ideology of the area. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it really isn't, it isn't very cut and dry or very clear, you know, who's the good guys, who's the bad guys, and, and all the different nuances that goes on with this, uh, this whole episode. Exactly. And one of the things he was really against uh, was, you know, as I said, simony and indulgences. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, only by selling indulgences, but later uh, against the indulgences uh, as a whole. But the funny thing is that uh, after Alexander V died, just a year ago he was elected, then uh, the, another pope was elected, which was John the uh, 23rd. And we're now talking about the, the um, antipopes, antipopes. And he was you know, a strong proponent of indulgences because uh, he needed money to conduct attacks against the real pope against Gregory the <laughs> Twelfth. <12th. laughs> yeah. And so, uh, because the king wanted the title back, 
he was supporting this. He was supporting uh, John the Twenty Third. He was supporting the indulgences. However, you know, uh, uh, Hus and his followers uh, didn't like this very much, and three of his followers were beheaded by the king because uh, they openly stood up against this, and this wasn't really uh, in like for the king. And this is a, you know, another conflict because uh, because who sided with this pope who was who wanted to raise money, you know, just to conduct conduct these attacks and to use these to unholy things. And uh, but uh, he he should have liked you know Gregory the Twelfth because he was poor, he was really pious, humble, and he ended up in exile. He really wasn't. He, he could not manage, you know, the church <laughs> properly. Yeah. So uh, that's another very interesting conflict in, with Jan Hus. Yeah, so uh, Hus is trying to uh, stamp out immorality. It's strange that he didn't like the legitimate pope because that seems to be the type of person that he's kind of advocating. Yes, and all, all these conflicts, uh, you know, raises from the fact that he needed the king to support him. But at the same time, the king needed the antipope. You know, we have a different these relationships, which are really you know in conflict with each with the these ideologies of uh, Jan Hus. Yeah, that was like a really complicated uh, character that really goes that from what I'm hearing and, and great information. It really does seem to me like he goes through different phases in his life as. Um, at one point, from what I gather, what you're saying, he at first seems to be uh, against the abuse of indulgences, but then later uh, denies him completely. If, I'm, if I caught uh, what you were saying correctly, yeah, 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 you're absolutely correct. <laughs> and and uh, also we, uh, regarding those immoralities, another interesting thing is, and we have testimony. This first-hand testimony is. Uh, First hand, no primary sources. Uh, even from his former friend, from uh, Stephen of Palach or Stepan Palach in Czech, who, who writes that on, uh, because of his uh, instigating uh, of the, the people who was listening to these uh, sermons and homilies, uh, most of it was uh, like a uh, you know, the rattling and ragtag, and uh, all these people attacked the clergy. You know, uh, for example, Palach, Palach says that uh, many holy priests were persecuted, some were killed, others were robbed or expelled from their own churches. Uh, for example, also in Klatovi and Jatets, two towns, uh, in these two towns, some of the priests uh, were burned and drowned uh, in water. Uh, unfortunately, we do not know anything about the number of the killed clergymen, nor do we know the names except of one, uh, a Dominican priest, uh, John, or Jan, who was a, obviously a very popular name, uh, also called Malik, uh, and uh, he was, he lived in Klatovi. So, you know, he didn't directly, you know, say, uh, go and kill these people, but uh, later, as he really was a big fan of Wycliffe, uh, uh, who was like really teaching on against the church, the visible church, the visible head of the church, uh, all these people who were listening to the sermons understood it, that we have to fight them, fight against them, and <laughs> even kill kill them. And uh, Jan, who uh, certainly know about this, but. He never apologized or never said anything about it. So it's it's you know it's quite horrible, and this was also brought up uh, by his former friends Stefan of uh, Palach in Constance. However, this was not the topic in Constance, so he wasn't tried for these things. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, some of the pro mainly Protestants also say that he uh, who's always stood fast to his preachings. Uh, 
And, you know, he was invited by John XXIII to go personally to Bologna, and, but he refused because, you know, he was afraid maybe, and he, he had the support of the king, so he, he didn't want to go there. Even though his predecessors, like uh, Jan from Znoimo uh, and Palec, as I mentioned before, uh, Jan, who was uh, in the head of the Wycliffe camp, they were also Wycliffeists. And but when the Pope uh, invited them, you know, they went there and eventually, you know, rejected this uh, Wycliffe teachings. So, but Jan, who didn't want to go there and face, you know, the Pope, face the cardinals, and this is how could he stand fast to, to his own teachings when at the same time he was not sure you know, <laughs> whether he can defend it in front of the court, and if in front of the Pope. And he was really hesitating even going to, to Constance, you know. Hmm. <laughs> the the uh, emperor, uh, King Sisigmund, really had to persuade him, you know, <laughs> because the king wanted, as he was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, he wanted peace in uh, Bohemia, which was full of heresy, of course, yeah. and therefore he he really needed who's to go there and somehow solve this situation. Incredible, and, really, really incredible information there. Um, just um, a lot of information to take in, and I know a lot of people that are tuning in. Uh, well, we would definitely recommend you watch it more times so you can really take in all the information. Just really uh, one point that you brought up earlier, and, and I wonder, you mentioned that he had a devotion to the Blessed Mother. The, now, when I look at Luther, I, I realize Luther goes through different phases within his Mariology. In Yen Hus, is, is there something similar or does he remain consistent in terms of his Mariology throughout his life? Absolutely, he does. Yeah, uh, and it is uh, very apparent from his uh, homilies and uh, and sermons, which we have now, uh, you know, in, in published. And there's, you know, Mary is all over the place. Uh, yeah. He was really devoted to her, and uh, she liked her very much. She was he was praying to her <laughs> as much as he could. So that that is why I'm saying that he, he wasn't really Protestant. He wasn't at the same time really Catholic. He was something, you know, in the middle. He adopted something from the cliff, something was rejected. And uh, some even say that he, he, he was a proponent of Sola Scriptura. However, I'm not really sure about it. Uh, really, you know, um, Scripture for was very important for him, and is it, it was in the on the first place, undoubtedly. But uh, but um, I think he was also uh, uh, you know citing and quoting the church fathers. Of course, he was you know quoting uh, them. He was cherry picking. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he just uh, used those stuff which which uh, which he liked uh, and. He, he also sometimes, you know, distorted all these or misinterpreted it. Something like you do, do, uh, did it with Westcott and how he manipulates with West Augustine, you know. <laughs> yeah. So these cheat tricks, right? So, yeah. but yeah, he, he he was in some in a part he was really really Catholic, and I think he was correct uh, in in his effort to correct you know the clergy but he went too far he really went too far yeah. yeah i can tell that and let me let me go ahead and briefly read what we've got here on the screen and then maybe you can give us your thoughts and then because i'm looking at it and really to me it sounds very catholic to me let me go ahead and read it and i i have to tell the audience so one thing that i am i know gary can appreciate it as well is the fact that you're going to first-hand source material that is one thing that really today a lot of people don't bother doing that kind of research and, and i greatly appreciate that and it says a reading from judith chapter 11 
There is not such another woman upon the earth in look, in beauty, and in sense of words. Since Judith, who killed Holofernes for the liberation of the nation, foreshadows the glorious mother of Christ and the virgin. Therefore, the words from above unequivocally refer to the virgin, divinely foreshadowed by Judith. And I really appreciate the bolding there because we, you know very well, we've got people, unfortunately, that will recognize whether early fathers or uh, reformers or what have you, quoting from the Deuterocanon. canon, and then they'll say, well, they're merely quoting it. You know, maybe they believed it to have been historical, but they didn't believe it to be divinely inspired. Yet what we're reading here, divinely foreshadowed by Judith. I'd like to maybe get your thoughts on that, Gary, and then hear what uh, David has to say about that. Yeah, no, well, yeah, well, I think he summed up very nicely. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this would be, uh, I, I would say he's definitely investing Judith with uh, some sort of inspired authority. Uh, I, I doubt if can you. It would be strange to say like Socrates divinely foreshadowed Jesus or something. You know, it, a secular figure that wouldn't make sense, but for a biblical figure that would make perfect sense. So, David, uh, be, actually, before we get into what you see in here, uh, maybe you can give us a quick rundown about what we see on the screen. Like, what's that top portion, and what's the stuff that follows? Yes, this is an, an uh, excerpt. excerpt. From, from his homilies, uh, it was it is called Postila in, in Czech, uh, and this one is from the Sermoni Sanctis because we have uh, two kinds of sermons from uh, Jan Hus. One on the uh, on the readings of uh, the Sunday masses, and we have homilies on the uh, readings from on different feasts. Uh, I looked in both, you know, and he's extensively using the Deuterocanon. Canon. I mean, <laughs> we can we could be here like all day, <laughs> <laughs> especially Syriac and Wisdom, but all of them, you know. And uh, what we currently see on the on the screen, we you can see on the upper part, it's in Czech, and then we have in Latin and the translation in English. Unfortunately, the English translation is uh, not published. I don't know if it's gonna be translated someday in the future, uh, but yet it's not still you know, translated and published, even though some works are, uh, are available from Jan Hus. And uh, <clears throat> you know, he made a lot of notes uh, to all, uh, all these readings. So we have the title uh, of the feast. So it's about the Blessed Virgin. And then we have a reading, you know, the reading which was read from the pulpit as the word of God, of course. And uh, the last part is his, uh, is his sermon. So there are actually uh, two things here very interesting. The first one is that we have a reading from Judith, you know, <laughs> yeah. even not even prior uh, trend, but even prior Florence. So we prior an ecumenical council. So the church still knew what was a holy writ because it was proclaimed publicly in every church, in the whole church, because these missiles were in not only in Czech Republic, they were everywhere, you know, and these sermons are uh, uh, Europeans are familiar with them, you know, and uh, so everybody knew, everybody really knew, for example, Judith was holy read because everybody read it, all the priests in the church. So there's absolutely no doubt that the church from the liturgy, which is part of the sacred tradition of the church, which is part of the deposit of the faith, we have, you know, <laughs> an absolutely official proclamation of Judith, for example, but all the other canonical books of being holy writ. Uh, I really liked uh, how you asked Dr. Fastigi uh, why we even need an ecumenical council to say that, yes, this is now a doctrine, this is now a dogma. And 
Yeah, we, we replied absolutely correctly. Why, why would you need such a pronouncement when everybody believes it? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, very good. Now, do you know the date approximately when this was made? Yes, uh, the, the lab, first he was uh, first he was uh, writing these in uh, in Latin. So this is another uh, you know a conspiracy th theory that uh, because uh, especially Czechs like to point at who is that he was a big nationalist. Uh, sh uh, sure, he 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 did some good stuff for the Czech language and writing and such. But he wasn't writing in uh, in the Czech language until like it was maybe for like three or two years before his trial. He was writing everything in Latin, and just subsequently he he was also writing these in Czech. I'm not really sure. Maybe four hundred thirteen or twelve, something like that. After he was expelled from Prague. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to think like where this would be in proportion to the um, the Council of Florence. Yeah, which... it's like a at least a century earlier before Florence. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay, it's well yeah. earlier. It seems that's a it, 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 that 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 is mind blowing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah because it, it, you know uh, some Protestants point out that you know this guy, you know this guy uh, rejected the theater canon. I mean. Yeah. Sorry, show me where the whole church rejected the Theater Canon. <laughs> yeah. Because what we see that the whole church was officially proclaiming the Theater Canon as sacred scripture. This is the most, most important. So, you know. Yeah, right. Uh, the impressions given that there, there's this huge scholarly consensus that you only follow the proto canon and the Deutero canon was like. Uh, Kind of off the radar screen. So when Luther rejects the the Deutero canon, there really wasn't any change, you know, from how it was before. Absolutely. So uh, yeah. So okay, what's uh, what are we looking at right here? Yes, this is the uh, another of his sermons. It's on the feast of the purification of the Blessed Virgin, and uh, we have a reading from uh, Malachi. And uh, he's like cross-referencing, you know, a lot of time, the, uh, also different parts of the Old Testament and also from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he's explaining uh, by using different parts of the Bible. Uh, and in this case, uh, maybe William can read it. I, I can, can see the, the lowest yeah, part. Definitely. Let, let, let me go ahead and uh, I'll read it. On the Feast of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin. A reading from Malachi chapter 3. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and shall refine them as gold and silver. And then we get to the, the wording. Also, the works that God's servant do are to be cleansed. Therefore, it is said here, and he shall cleanse the sons of Levi. From here, Isaiah 52. Be you clean, you that carry the vessels of the Lord. And in chapter four, in one Maccabees, and he chose priests without blemish, whose will was set upon the law of God, and they cleansed the holy places. That is from Mac one Maccabees, verses 42 to 43. Wow. Yeah, and he's combining, the, you know, without any qualification, the proto canon, the deuterocanon. canon. He's just using it as holy writ in both, both cases. Yeah, it's absolutely apparent yeah. that he accepted the other canon, no, no doubt about it. Really yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll toss it over to, to tell me what you think, Gary. But from what I'm looking at here, um, as you know very well, whenever feast days are celebrated in the church, you're reading from scripture. To me, it looks like he's the Deuter canons right there, intermixed with. Uh, what we would uh, term uh, proto-canonical texts, he makes no distinction whatsoever. Clearly, he viewed uh, one Maccabees as scriptural. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was just, um, was just going to say basically the same thing. There doesn't seem to be any qualification. And I always think of, I always try to double check against my Catholic bias 
and just try to imagine whether if I was at a Baptist church, whether uh, the, pe- the, uh, the preacher would make that kind of uh, citation without any qualification, whether some people in the congregation would, you know, be up in arms like, why are you, why are you quoting from First Maccabees? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that brings up the, uh, uh, the fact that, you know, I also really wanted to find something like from, I don't know, three Maccabees, the prayer of Manasseh, uh, whatever, you know, did uh-huh. he use them in his sermons? Not once, you know, he really, really? strictly used scripture. So, <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, William, uh, let's try the next slide. So, so far, we've had Judith. We have first Maccabees. Uh, what do we Look have? Look at this. We've, we've got, apparently, on the very same feast day, second homily. For Christ was foreshadowed in parables, like Isaac, born of a barren woman, foreshadowed Christ, who was to be born of the virgin. The rod became green and bore fruit. For the virgin conceived and bore Christ. It was foreshadowed in the scriptures, as in chapter 49, Genesis reading, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from among his tribes, until the one that shall be sent come. And this is the expectation of the nations. And in Baruch chapter 3, he was seen upon the earth and conversed with men. I'm I'm blown away by that. And I'd like to get your your gentleman's thoughts, and then I'll tell you what I think about that. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go, and then Dave, uh, yeah, well, f- again, we have another foreshadowing of Scripture, and it's explicit. He's quoting it as Scripture. Um, it, another thing, too, and if I know David and those watching, if you've watched any of the videos I've been doing, especially in the last uh, month or so, you know that Baruch 3 is one of those key uh, proof texts from the Old Testament about the incarnation. So it, it, to me, this strikes me as, uh, you know, he, he's not just uh, diving in the scripture to find obscure things. He's, he's going and going to, he's going to, of course, the famous uh, prophecy of Christ in Genesis 49. And then he goes to Baruch uh, 338, which again, it's like one of those things you see in the fathers over and over again, yeah. quoting as foreshadowing Christ. So he fits right in with the early church's usage. David? Yeah, I absolutely agree. <clears throat> and I think I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, Gary, you took the words out of my mouth that I was going to mention how uh, you find it over and over in the early fathers and how they noticed that as well in Baruch 3. So for me, the, the incredible thing that I see here that I, I have not done a lot of deep research into Baruch once we get into the medieval era and beyond. But now we're in a period of church history uh, shortly before Florence, and the usage of Baruch here seems to me to be very in line with the way the early church utilized it as being a, uh, something prophetic, something divine, and really that's incredible. Yeah. Wow, here is, uh, here is something amazing. So on the assumption of the Blessed Virgin, I thought that that was created in the 1900s, that dogma. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, oh, you're bad. Yeah, but we've got a reading from Ecclesiasticus chapter 24. And in all these I sought rest, and I shall abide in the inheritance of the Lord. Although the words of this epistle primarily relate to the uncreated wisdom, they may secondarily relate to the glorious Virgin Mary. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That, that, that is something that I, uh, I've barely begun to dig into that, uh, that particular reading there. That is, uh, that is amazing. Yeah. David, any comments on this? Yeah. Just, uh, you know, one, one comment on the, on the different feasts about Mary. Uh, there was one dogma, maybe, which was still, uh, you know, in the beginning of the 15th century, still wasn't a dogma. Was it the perpetual virginity, I think? I'm not sure for now. But uh, 
what what uh, what century are you talking about? Because perpetual virginity was uh, that was doc that was dogmatized quite early. Yeah, quite. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but are you, uh, are you thinking of uh, perhaps the Immaculate Conception that you can find in 1854? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, okay. the Immaculate Conception, and I read that you know some part uh, part of the clergy uh, you know like hesitated whether to give sermons on this. Uh, some yeah. of the such so sure, no problem. Some of they were more careful. Like everybody, you know, was like uh, coherent on the the <clears throat> the immaculate conception. Uh, however, they still were a little bit careful with the sermons. But this you can't you can't see this uh, attitude in in uh, in the Buter canon. Like <laughs> you know, they were yeah. <laughs> preaching from them. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I find interesting here, of course, is that, you know, he says that the primary uh, reading of uh, Sirach concerns the uncreated wisdom, which is which is true. Yeah. Um, so he sees this as uh, Christologically, you know, this is primarily a Christological passage. Yep. But secondarily, it could relate to Mary, which I, that's kind of interesting, too, because William... You've done a lot of work, especially in the early church fathers with Mary. Yeah. And that's very common that usually if there's a Christological interpretation, there could be a secondary uh, Marian interpretation as well. No doubt, Gary, which is why I'm a, a little bit of a, a pleasant kind of shock here, because I've begun doing digging into this particular area here and uh, looking at how the fathers view that as well. And this is pretty incredible. But as you gentlemen know very well, one particular thing that I have noticed very often is with individuals, with fathers, even with church councils, even with creeds, once we get to the uh, Ephesus Creed and Chalcedon, uh, proper Christology has always included the Virgin Mary in its language to really clarify the, her identity, her incredible role in salvation history, and we have that even here as well. From what I'm gathering, from what I'm reading here, it's amazing because we've got a, a um, sermon that is um, on, from what I gather, I know it says the assumption of the Blessed Virgin. I can only assume perhaps the, that festival is the Dormition and the bodily assumption are, because as you know very well, in the early church, uh, some festivals were called festival of the Dormition, but even that being said, the bodily assumption of Mary went hand in hand with the Dormition, because you don't have any fathers, you don't have any figures such as Germanus, John Damascene, Deotechnos, all of them, when they gave their sermons on Mary's Dormition, they included that bodily assumption of Mary into heaven, and I catch that here as well, and in all these I sought rest, I view that as being uh, Mary's Dormition there, and then her abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, that bodily assumption of Mary into heaven, where she is now with the angels and with our Lord and Savior in heaven. Just my reading. Um, uh, I, am I, what do you gentlemen think? Um, yeah, that's, that sounds good to me. Um, yeah, it's interesting he pulls this line out from Sirach, because unlike Proverbs 8, which also talks about uh, God's wisdom, and uh, there's a lot of affinity between Proverbs 8 and the prologue of John. Yeah. Here, Sirach actually talks about God's wisdom dwelling in, in a specific location. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that that would be the focal point. And also that would be have Mariological connotations, too. That's very interesting. Yeah, that is why I say I'm, I really feel sorry for Hus because, you know, he was good <laughs> in scripture. I mean... He was really a good theologian. Really, you know, I feel sorry that he had to go to these uh, heresies about weekly. And David, you said that uh, probably the most often cited from the Deuterocanon was Sirach and Wisdom? Just yeah, yeah, these two passages that I was able to found. <laughs> you know, these two were almost in, in every sermon. <laughs> oh, wow. Like even more like proto proto canonical books, really interesting. Yeah, incredible. Uh, yeah. So we've got another reading here, and um, 
let me let me see this is not a feast day though is it is this a feast day yes um, it's on the, the okay. day of the apostle jacob gotcha perfect okay on the day of jacob the apostle a reading from matthew chapter 20 mark chapter 10 but jesus called them to him and said you know that the princes of the gentiles lord it over him here and this is here's a commentary here he rejects their ambition and indignation here it is to know that every proper principality is to be based in virtue if the prince does not get it he accepts the name not of the principality but of tyranny or roguery and such a prince uses power and not piety but here king artaxerxes in the book of esther chapter 13 whereas i reigned over many nations and had brought all the world under my dominion i was not willing to abuse the greatness of my power but to govern my subjects with clemency and lenity what are your thoughts in this here gary this is per this is quite interesting that we uh we have look i mean we've we've gone through plenty of readings so far and i thus far i am very I, I, I shouldn't be surprised, but um, you see a consistent usage of the Deuterocanon canon as sacred scripture in Yan Hus. What are your thoughts on this here in particular? Yeah, um, well, for those who maybe don't know, the, the book of Esther incl includes some deuterocanonical sections. So, David, I, I assume that you included this because he's quoting from a deuterocanonical section in Esther. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. And... You know, uh, as he liked all this moral stuff and uh, uh, and uh, the virtues, and he's drawing this from the the uh, the, the Deuterocanonical passage from Esther. So he wouldn't base it <laughs> really his moral teachings on some man-made stuff. You know, <laughs> the man yeah. is himself who really you know wanted the scripture to be in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, and like you said in your introduction, uh, the focus is on uh, uh, immorality of, uh, you know, uh, prelates in the church. And so this, like you said, this is uh, actually uh, a key, very important part of his preaching, right? Yes, yes, yeah. it is. It is. Very interesting. And then we have another one. On the day of Philip and Jacob. A reading from Wisdom, chapter 5. Then shall the just stand with constancy. In this epistle is the end of the good, which is a great steadfastness in Judgment Day, when it is said, the righteous shall stand, etc. Two, the end of the evil, which is wailing and terrible distress, as it is said, these seeing it shall be troubled with fear. Thus, the double end of the dual state is included, which the text of the Bible clarifies after this epistle in chapter 4 and 5. That is why it is written in the Bible. Then shall they stand when the wicked come with fear, and their iniquities will be brought against them. Now, he's got to be using the term Bible there in another way. He really has to be. He can't be, he can't be talking about it being a sacred scripture, can he, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be something else. Uh, yeah, Biblia. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep. So, uh, David, yeah, why don't you walk us through this? Yeah, we have the uh, third reading from a Deuterocanonical canonical book, <laughs> which is interesting because it, it, it doesn't have a homily on you know, each and every feast and on each and every mass, you know, on the year. But we have really just a little from from, from uh, his sermons, but already we have a uh, testimony of uh, three deuterocanonical books read as, you know, uh, as the God of, word of God. Yeah. Uh, regarding the, regarding the uh, homily itself, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it, uh, it says for itself. <laughs> it's yeah, also it interesting that his, his, Operating wisdom by using wisdom. Yes. Yeah. This seems to be almost like a running commentary on wisdom. And uh, one thing that jumps out to me, David and William, is that um, the, he sees this as 
prophecy about judgment day. So, um, you know, that I think that also speaks for uh, it being more than just human writings in his mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I think that um, the very fact that he would be quoting this in line with, with a uh, fear and trembling and judgment day it is very clear that he viewed this views this as an exhortation being given from, from sacred scripture. I don't think there's any doubt at all. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, sometimes it's like a commentary. Sometimes he uh, like quotes other stuff from different places of the scripture. Yeah. But yeah, I totally agree. Why would he even mention it? It if he wouldn't regard it as sacred scripture. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. A reading from Luke chapter 21 on the day of St. Ludmilla of Bohemia. This poor widow hath cast in more than they all, for all these have their abundance cast into the offerings of God. Here it means that there are those who have an abundance of early estates and of them giving alms is of great merit. There are those who have just enough and of those giving alms is more merit. These two are discussed in Tobit chapter four. If thou have much, give abundantly. If thou have a little, take care even so to bestow willingly a little. Gentlemen, I'm just so pleased that uh, the book of Tobit has gotten representation in, in Haas because as you know very well, Gary, uh, we frequently, uh, you, you're gonna hear a lot from the book of Sirach, a lot from the book of wisdom, but indeed, even the book of Tobit is such an incredibly solemn biblical book. Um, I'm very pleased to see the usage of this on a, on a feast day, uh, which is very, very interesting here. Gentlemen, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, go ahead, David. Yeah, I, th I think uh, this passage also, uh, also shows that uh, how much he was uh, Catholic <laughs> yeah. and not representing the faith alone. Um, theory or theology that's the first thing that goes in my mind and I saw uh, using him Tobit also on praying maybe for the dead or something like that. I'm not sure right now but uh, I could use also other other passages where him utilizing Tobit for sure yeah um, if you go on the internet at a uh, where they have pages for reasons why the so-called apocrypha are in scripture. One of the main knocks against Tobit is that it teaches merit. <laughs> and, and here you have Jan Hus basically approvingly, you know, quoting yeah. Tobit to support. And he actually uses a meritum magnum, you know, great merit. Yeah, gentlemen, that's incredible. And uh, Gary, I appreciate your, your, your comments on that because uh, Gary has done a lot of work uh, in the field of justification, it has even you can check it out, check out his website. It's a great debate he's done on the topic as well. But you know, just to toss this to you, Gary, do you think you could walk into a Protestant service in 2021 <laughs> and hear them preach and use this kind of language and quoting Tobit? Uh, I, I don't think that would happen. I don't think so either. <laughs> I mean, even no. high church Anglicanism. No, I mean, yeah, the, um, yeah. This is uh, this was a very good selection, David, in that uh, it shows he's authoritatively using Tobit, and even more so, he's using it to affirm something in a positive sense. He's not saying it's impossible or something. Uh, something that seems to be, you know, one of those hot button topics between Catholics and Protestants. Jan Hus seems to be on the Catholic side. Yeah. He is indeed. Uh, just if I can jump in for a while, you mentioned the uh, inner NCS topic. But as I'm a doctor, you know, I always laugh when they say, uh, Tobit used the fish gods for medicinal purpose, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, absolutely nonsense. Uh, actually, if somebody learns something from the history of medicine, we have articles about it. The, the Mesopotamians used it. For, uh, for healing the cataracts. And also Salsas used it. It's not that today we don't use it. No, <laughs> I mean, it, it was really used. It's just a little note on the on yeah. that side. 
Yeah, uh, very I don't think I don't think that that is a little note. I think it's a very big and important point you just made there that uh, for the longest time we've heard, hey, you know what that what kind of magic superstition are you Catholics promoting and putting forth? David, thank you very much for that clarification. I think that that is a very, very important point. Sure, no problem. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, and what we've got here next, we have apparently uh, a bit of a sermon from the feast day of John the Baptist to give people a little bit of clarification. <clears throat> Before we read, and we're clearly going to follow in line with what, what, what we've been reading as of late, proto-canonical texts and the Deuter canon there, but to fill in the people on the importance of what we're about to see. In the early church, feast days of Mary, of course, we recognize Christ for um, first and foremost, his, uh, Christmas and what have you, uh, were very important, the Easter, the most important ones. But when we're talking about creatures, uh, feast days of creatures, Mary and feast days were the most important. And then after Mary, John the Baptist had great significance. So if we're about to realize, quoting a deuterocanonical book on such a magnificently important feast day, carries a lot of weight with it. I just want the audience that are tuning in to realize that. Let me go ahead and read. A reading from Luke chapter one. And it came to pass when he executed the priestly function. The office that gives grace and thus love depends on five things. One prayer, <clears throat> two preaching, three in the celebration of the mass, four providing sacraments, five in keeping clean the vessels that belong to the temple of God, <clears throat> these are the five talents which the Lord gave to his sons. But unfortunately, there are many who don't perform the office of the priest, but who boast in the name of dignity of the priesthood, according to 1 Kings chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now the sons of Heli were children of Belial, not knowing the Lord, nor the office of the priests of the people. Further, in 2 Maccabees chapter 4, quoting it, in so much that the priests were not now occupied about the offices of the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the gains. Gentlemen, love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, David, why don't you start off? Sure. Uh, it might be surprising for some people, but uh, the Hussites really liked uh, the book of the Maccabees because mm -hmm. they they felt uh, like as if they were something like in a Maccabean revolt. And it's especially true for Jan Zizka, who was a big leader of the radical movement of the Hussites because the Hussites were, uh, uh, weren't unified. They were two wings. There was a radical wing and there was a moderate wing, the Taborites and the Utraquists. And Jan Zizka was you know, a big fighter for the Hussites. And uh, he, he, he also quoted Second Maccabees a lot. As I said, he, he, he identified himself as a, <laughs> as a Maccabean. And yeah. what is very, very, very interesting that uh, uh, the churches in the Czech Republic, but also elsewhere, uh, who who claimed to follow the Hussite legacy and the legacy of Jan Hus. One of them is the Czechoslovak Hussite church. And very interesting because I asked one, one, uh, uh, one priest whether they, they recognize the Deuterocanon as inspired scripture, apocrypha. They said, no, it's, a, it's apocrypha. Well, believe it or not, but in, uh, on the, they have this feast on Jan Zizka, and the antiphona in the beginning of the mass is from Second Maccabees. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, Be interesting. Because of the Hussites, you know, <laughs> they all yeah. embrace these books as Holy Scripture. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, here we have Second Maccabees. So I think that's all seven of the two canonical books uh, cited by Jan Hus. And uh, without qualification with First Samuel chapter 2. Uh, it fits perfectly in this context. There's no kind of qualification. But yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that. Is this the, the last of the slides? I can't yeah, remember. it sure is. It is the final one. That's correct. 
Yeah. So David, um, so Jan Hus most definitely uh, accepted the I, deuterocanon. Oh, I think ahead. we missed missed the deuterocanonical book of uh, from Susanna. Um, I mean Dan, Daniel. Oh, maybe you one, know but, that might have been my fault. Maybe I. But I just for the our audience, we I, I found all the deuterocanonical books and all the passages <laughs> from both Esther Daniel. So <laughs> no worries. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, no so, yeah, you did. You covered all the bases. Yeah. So Jan Hus, I, I, just from this sampling, and you said this is just a, a small group of uh, citations that could be given. Clearly, he's seeing this as inspired scripture. Div, uh, the Judith divinely prefigures. Um, you know, it, it's, it talks about the end times. Invest it with divine weight. But and you said that the his immediate followers also um, accepted the Deutero canon, but modern day Hussites do not. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Because <clears throat> but there is nothing such as apocrypha, you know, for labeling the Deutero canon as apocrypha. Really, not until the, the Reformation, they would really, really oppose this, you know, theologically uh, labeling the Deuterocanon as apocrypha. And it's also apparent from uh, how they used the Bibles uh, subsequently after Jan Hus was, uh, was uh, burned at the stake, and there were the Hussit Wars, and after that, uh, eventually they won the wars. And uh, the Hussites were also uh, recognized as one of the, you know, regular churches besides the Catholic Church in Bohemia. So this is interesting. And Hussites weren't only in Czech Republic, but they were all over the place in Europe. Um, I know also about Hungarian Hussites uh, who, who translated the, the uh, Bible into Hungarian. Actually, it's a, the first Hungarian translation of the Bible was made by Hussites. Maybe a lot of people don't know it. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have copies of this Bible, but uh, it is mentioned in some chronicles, and we know it, uh, it contained the, the deuterocanonical books, such as you know, Baruch, Judith, and so on. But there are also copies of the Bibles in uh, Czech language, which were translated by Hussites. Uh, I can mention the Prague Bible, which was the first printed Bible. Uh, it's also available online. Uh, we have the Bible of Jiří Melantry, which was very popular uh, until the, the Kralica Bible was published by the, by the Protestants. So it was the probably most utilized. And even, you know, some people uh, or scholars debate whether uh, Hus himself may be, uh, may be uh, translated or edited the, the old Czech version of the Bible, which contained the deuterocanonical books. Wow. So uh, it's really not up until the Reformation, uh, just to give you some years, for example, the Prague Bible was uh, published 1488. Uh, the Melantrich Bible was 1549. And, uh, and the Hungarian Hussite Bible was in 1436 and 1439, all, all uh, containing the Deuterocanonical canonical books. And the first Protestant Czech Bible was uh, the Kralica Bible which was translated from the original languages, not from the Latin Vulgate, uh, so from Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. And this is the first Bible uh, which, which uh, had this section, Apocrypha, uh, and it was published, I think, 1579, yes. Okay, wow, that's but even more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So before these, these Protestant Bibles, we have all the time the deuterocanonical books there, not labeled as apocrypha, but as inspired scripture intermixed. But which is uh, 
uh, what is really interesting that the first uh, Hungarian Protestant Bible, which was translated by uh, Károly Gáspár, he was a Calvinist pastor, and he translated the first Protestant Hungarian Bible, which in 1590, which is called the Bijoy, Bijoy Bible or Bijoy Biblia. And believe it or not, he didn't label the Deuteronomy canon as apocryphal. He just intermixed it uh, without any qualification. And after the book of the books of the Maccabees, uh, he says, uh, this is the end of the book of the Maccabees and the end of the Old Testament. Ah, interesting. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's just, just like the Colophon and uh, Luther's German Bible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't distinct, made any distinction or qualification, which is, I think, quite unique in Protestant Bibles. And, <laughs> and really, uh, again, I always have to laugh when some Protestants bring up some you know, codices and some, some Bibles which have, you know, lack something or have added something. <laughs> but I can show you a Protestant Bible <laughs> which, which <laughs> added the Deuter canon without any qualification. Does this mean the Protestants accepted them? No, it doesn't, right. apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, William, do you have any follow up question? Because I have another one, but it's a slightly different topic. The one thing that I am noticing here, Gary, and it's really, really incredible, is that the usage of the Deuterocanon, the inclusion of the Deuterocanon in, the, in, the, in all these Bibles, really to me, and it's a, a bit of a shameless promotion for a future show we're <laughs> going to do as well, a future show um, where we're going to cover how you see the very same thing in German Bibles prior to Martin Luther, and spoiler alert, even after and of course, afterwards, it becomes a little bit of a, um, a hazier kind of image. But before that, you find them always included there. So when I hear this kind of information that you're presenting to us, just really uh, incredible information and really in line with what we see at the North African councils, where these books were always included as part of Holy Writ. Yeah, David, any comments? Yeah, I... I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my question is, uh, I know you've, you've watched my presentation on the Anabaptist uh, reception of the Deuterocanon. And uh, that's interesting, too, because the Anabaptist movement, um, uh, they also, they begin very positively, but eventually they, they flip and then reject the books. Um, do you see something similar going on with the Hussites? Yes, uh, definitely. Yeah, because uh, as I said, the Hussites weren't really unified. They were also fighting with each other. And uh, later, after, <clears throat> uh, as these Hussites had kids and the Jes Jesuits came into Bohemia, then the, their kids you know, uh, eventually started uh, learning in these Jesuit schools, so they eventually, you know, converted back to Catholicism, or mm -hmm. after the Protestantism, uh, they they joined the uh, some of the evangelicals, and they uh, like perished, you know. So uh, there weren't like who sides who accepted the the or did or reject rejected the Deuterocanon. canon. Rather, they just convert. So today you won't find any you know, genuine Hussite. <laughs> there is like a church, it's called the Morav Moravian Church or uh, the Bohemian Brethren. Uh, they claim they're you know, the successors, but uh, they're not the real you know, Hussites. And all these churches who claim to be the, the followers, they, they're, they're rather Protestants or evangelicals and such. So I would say maybe it, it's slightly different that the Adam Baptists uh, like <clears throat> uh, started rejecting maybe the Deuterocanon, canon, but the Hussites just simply perished. Okay. Well, wow. interesting. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you came on the channel because uh, like I said, at the beginning, uh, 
especially in English, there's very, very little information available. Yeah. So unless uh, you're able to find a Latin and dig into Latin, um, they, I just, uh, I can't thank you enough, David, for doing all the, the book work and, and all the reading and research. Sure. And you no, know, there is, there can be a lot to say about who's the who sides. It's a huge, huge topic. And all these inconsistencies, I, I, I told you in the beginning, um, I, I could go on the whole day yeah. <laughs> in the constants and the aftermath and how the who sides treated the Catholics and such. Um, there's a, there are really big misconceptions out there. And, uh, and I understand because there are not really many writers and historians uh, who wrote on this topic in English. Maybe Fudge was the last one who, is, who did a good job, but uh, I know you still, I think it's still better to go to all the primary sources and the Czech and the Latin, and which will reveal you the whole truth. And yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. that. And, and of course, the pleasure was all mine. I, oh, I'm we, very we, happy that we, I could. And we look forward to, we, we're definitely going to have you back on. We had a great time dialoguing. We got to bring you back on. And we just greatly, greatly appreciate uh, everything you've been doing. But before we, before we conclude the show, David, uh, do you have a channel? Do you have uh, anywhere where people can find, uh, you know, work you've been doing and, on the Catholic faith or anything along those lines, or are you pretty much just, Hey, William, uh, I'm hiding out and I don't want these people to come down and come out and find me. <laughs> well, you, give any, any plug for anything you're working on brother where people can find you. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing my PhD research from, from my you know, subject in medicine. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> someone can find an article, <laughs> but, uh, I don't have a channel, but I'm a notorious follower of uh, the Apocrypha, Apocrypha Apocalypse <laughs> and your channel, William. You both are doing a, a magnificent work and uh, I like it very much and really hands down, hands down. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, Thank you. I'm so glad that you found us and uh, all the great contributions that you're made. And yeah, we'll definitely have to have you on. Maybe we could talk about uh, Tobin's Fish or something like that. Uh, that <laughs> yeah, that'd be an interesting idea. program. Sure, no problem. I, I, I would be happy to, to right. participate. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Well, uh, man, uh, well, I think we'll probably close down right about now. For those who are watching, if you like this stuff, please. Uh, subscribe if you haven't uh, hit that thumbs up button and also the bell you know that will notify you because sometimes <laughs> William you know when we're doing live streams it, it could be I know that crazy Gary, I, I, I've had people tell me hey I subscribe but I only caught it afterwards well I, I've learned you got to put that bell on and you'll get the notification there you go yeah all right so uh, William any final words I just had a great time, uh, had a fantastic time uh, with David and with you, Gary. I look forward to all future material. Everybody tune in. Uh, we've got a lot more incredible material coming your way. And hey, pray for me, pray for Gary, pray for the brother David. And we look forward to talking to you all again. Thank you, everybody. Right. <laughs> Sorry, William, maybe I, I uh, we're, we're not recording now, right? We're off. We are off now. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs>